but it is with great pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Sloman um, to give a lecture, the first of many today uh, <laughs> at our institute. Um, I'm sure all of you know him already, but he's been for 27 years in, uh, at the University of Sussex before he moved to uh, the University of Birmingham, where he retired at 2001. And the interesting thing to say about him is that even though from 2002, I think, uh, he's been an honorary professor, uh, he's still working full time, uh, so that goes to his uh, credit. Uh, and another interesting point is that he actually started in philosophy and uh, metaphysics, Kant, etc. Uh, but then I think he evolved and he moved into uh, artificial intelligence and computer science. So today we'll hear more, I think, about the cognitive science side of things. Maybe. <laughs> okay. That's my, my goal. My talks are unpredictable, as some people, one or two people in this room know. Um, just a minor modification to that, I won't use an abusive term like correction. Uh, I started with doing maths and physics at uh, Cape Town University and uh, got my degree in 1956 and wanted to be a mathematician. And I went to Oxford and I had already become interested in philosophy and started going to talks at the Student Christian Association because I was an atheist and felt that error needed to be corrected. Mm -hmm. And there was a PhD student, a very bright colored guy called Adam Small, who sort of sussed me out pretty quickly. He was doing a PhD in philosophy. So he took me aside and said, you're a spiteful skeptic, just like David Hume, but you need some educating. This is a loose paraphrase. And he gave me Russell's History of Western Philosophy. So I read that and thought, wow, Russell's the greatest philosopher who ever lived. Um, anyway. That's background. Went to Oxford, started doing my mathematics, and gradually uh, started making new philosophical acquaintances and going to philosophy graduate seminars and so on, and hearing people saying things about mathematics that I thought were wrong. Roughly speaking, this is a very crude summary of stuff. Uh, they introduced me to the debate between Hume and Kant, and Hume, the, the sort of caricature, had said there's two kinds of knowledge. One kind, is empirical, then you have to go and measure and weigh and observe and so on to find out whether it's true or false and there's no other way, you can't just work it out. And the other kind you can work out but it's all trivial, like all bachelors are unmarried. It's trivial because you're starting from definitions of bachelor and it already includes unmarried and so on. Now I haven't studied Hume um, and I suspect because he was a smart bloke, he was much more sophisticated than what I thought these people attributed to him and anyway, but they thought uh, Kant had said um, on reading Hume's stuff, uh, no, this is wrong. Mathematics doesn't fit that into either of those two categories. It's neither empirical when you discover that 3 plus 5 equals 8. Once you've worked it out, you don't have to go checking that it works on eggs and oranges and mountains and whatever. Um, and uh, neither is it trivial, like all bachelors are unmarried, because you can't just produce definitions and, and use logic and so on. Um, we may or may not get round to Frege's attempt to show that the second alternative was the right one, which I think is widely believed, but I think is not correct. But we, as I say, we may or may not get it. Anyway, so I read Kant and I thought, yes, he's understood what mathematics is about. And I had a lot of examples and, and talked about causation and so on, and I think maths and causation are closely connected. So I started arguing with these philosophers and I quite enjoyed it, and I felt they needed education, so I thought I'd better switch to philosophy. So, um, eventually, after an interim period as a, as a mathematical logic uh, student, where I, that was a sort of first stage in the transition, I had a, a guy who was a very distinguished logician, some of you will know his name, Hao Wang, who spent most of his time programming logic theorem provers for IBM at that time. This was 19, around about 1959, 60. And we got on well, but I felt this isn't quite the kind of stuff that I wanted to do. So I switched again and became a philosophy graduate student. I later discovered that they made a dreadful mistake because I'd been going to philosophy graduate seminars. They thought I was a philosophy graduate. And I had no philosophy qualifications. They should have said, no, you can't. But they weren't thorough enough, and so they let me switch. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I eventually got my default trying to show that Kant was right. I didn't read all of Kant. I think I spent one th summer reading quite a lot of the critique of pure reason. And uh, I met Carl here as a result of meeting Aviv through his online stuff, who told me I should talk to Carl because I, he knows a lot about Kant. 
And last night I got a refresher tutorial, which was wonderful over dinner. And I think he mostly convinced me that I hadn't made any disastrously mistaken interpretations of Kant. So you can half blame him if I've made any mistakes. <laughs> anyway, so... Hang on, Car Car Carl or Kant? Okay. You can half blame him for not detecting my errors and correcting them. Right, okay, if I did make it. But he only had a few hours. Okay. Um, and some errors take longer than that in philosophy to, to uncover. Yeah. Anyway, so I finished my thesis. And I think they nearly failed me, but one of the examiners was Elizabeth Anscombe, whom I had encountered in seminars, so she knew I was Jewish and she is very religious, and she felt we can't save a member of the chosen people. <laughs> so, I mean, we can't fail a <laughs> member, <laughs> member of the chosen people. So she argued against the other examiner, and I got through it. So I had my PhD, and then I had to try to get a job. And I got a job teaching logic and philosophy of mathematics at um, logic and philosophy of science at Harley University, and then two years later moved to Sussex University, which was uh, where I stayed for 27 years. And then a guy, and I, I knew I'd got my thesis, and I knew I'd written lots of stuff. Unfortunately, nobody had told me you must get this stuff published. <laughs> and it sat there, and it's still uh, a few years ago, Oxford. I think mine was the first thesis they digitized, because I wrote and said, do you plan to digitize theses? You've got mine there. And the woman said, that's interesting. We were, we were just about to do it. Shall we use yours to check the system? I said, fine. So it got digitized, but without OCR. So there's masses of partly unreadable, blurry stuff. And one of my challenges to people who think computers can do what brains can do is to get an OCR system to read my thesis, <laughs> turn it into text. But anyway, whereas all of you, would, if you ever wanted to, you could easily do it. There's a copy on my website. But the first three chapters I did with a lot of hassle and lots of rewriting get into readable text. But that's by the way. So I had this stuff and I, I knew I was right and Kant was right, but I felt I hadn't got the arguments right. I felt there were, there were missing bits and I struggled and I wrote some papers and so on. And then in 1969 a guy called Max Clues, C-L-O-W-S, looked like Klaus, but anyway, he was one of the leading artificial intelligence vision researchers in the UK and I think was quite well known generally. He came to Sussex to work in experimental psychology where the head of psychology experimental psychology wanted to introduce AI. He was very ahead of most psychologists at the time. This is a guy called Stuart Sutherland, who was very clever and very difficult to, <laughs> to get on with and so on. But anyway, he brought um, Max Clues, and somehow Max and I met, and we um, got on very well, and I started learning to program. I had never done any computing, but then I was in my mid-30s. Uh, but I'd, I'd learned about lambda calculus when I was interacting with Hale Wang and so on. So I, and I knew some logic and a maths degree, so learning to program wasn't particularly hard, although it w was starting fairly late. I later discovered that for the last five years before I did this, Margaret Bowden, who was my colleague, whom I had met at a philosophy of science thing, I uh, 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 suggested she come to Sussex, and she'd already decided she wanted to go there, and she came, and we got over. She never mentioned that she had been studying and reading and writing reviews of stuff on artificial intelligence. So I didn't learn anything from her, which I could have done. In her case, I think it was timidity. She, she thought philosophers would think she was stupid to waste her time on that stuff. Anyway, so I got my AI, not from her, which I could have done earlier, but from Max. And um, then he bullied me into submitting a paper for the second International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence because he had given me a copy of a paper by McCarthy and Hayes, which some of you may know, in 1969, called Some Philosophical Problems from the Standpoint of Artificial Intelligence, in which they argued that a version of logic with slightly extended with things called fluence for dealing with things that change over time, but the details don't matter. Basically, predicate calculus was adequate for an intelligent system as a means of representation, a medium of representation for encoding everything they needed to do and for manipulating it. And they had three claims, partly echoing, I don't know whether this was conscious, deliberate, or just accidental, I never asked him, Chomsky's claims about the requirements for linguistics theories, which he said they can be observationally adequate, explanatorily adequate, or um, descriptively adequate, observationally or explanatory. <laughs> Never mind what Chomsky meant by that, but they're loosely related to what McCarthy and Hayes talked about, which was, um, on the, at the extreme, metaphysical adequacy, the notation can express anything that ever needs to be expressed about the universe. Um, 
epistemological adequacy means the notation can express anything humans or other intelligent uh, uh, organisms need to be able to know, reason about, think about, learn about, and whatever. And then the third claim was that it's also heuristically adequate. Namely, if you're going to actually use this stuff, you can do all the efficient manipulation that can be done in logic. And that last step hit me as badly mistaken because I knew from my experience of doing the kind of mathematics that used to be taught widely and isn't anymore, though some of you may have learned it, which is Euclidean geometry, which I learned at school, which I now regard as a great privilege that most youngsters in the UK certainly don't have. Um, I knew that I wasn't using logic, I was using something different, and I also knew that if I tried to translate into logic what I was doing there, I might be able to do it, but it would be very tedious and difficult. And, and So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, with this high-powered audience, I s does anybody know a proof that the three angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees? Nobody? Or you just... I yes, just, okay, so you not know. Right. Yes. I assume you'd all know, <laughs> right. Uh, but anyway, there's a standard proof. You take an arbitrary triangle. I've got a diagram, but with this audience, I don't need to. Take an arbitrary triangle, and then you draw, you choose one of the, one of the sides of the triangles, and then you choose the opposite vertex. You draw a line through that vertex parallel to this angle, and then you extend the lines a bit, or, or no, you don't need to do that with this version. You look at the three angles that you get at the top, and you can use facts about parallelism of these two lines and this line to say this angle equals that one up there, and so on. Um, and those three add up to a straight line, therefore the three into the one. And I had a student at Sussex, who, well, she wasn't, she was a student there, who had done um, maths and, and philosophy and had become a maths teacher. And so she'd met me when she was doing some philosophy. And a few years after she'd graduated, there was a knock on my door and she said, hello, Erin, can we talk? <laughs> and uh, some of you heard the story from me, I apologize. She said, I've been teaching mathematics and some of my students find this uh, proof a bit difficult to understand and I've got another one and I wonder if it's all right. So I said, okay, what's your other proof? And she said, well, you start with this triangle and instead of drawing a parallel line somewhere, you just use the lines that are there. You don't draw any new lines, but you stick a pencil or something on, on one of the sides of the triangle and then you move it to the end of that side and you rotate it through the angle to get to the next side of the triangle and then you move it to the opposite end if it's not already there uh, and then you rotate it through that angle so it's now gone through two angles and then you rotate it through the final angle to get back to the initial side and what's happened is pointing in the opposite direction so it went like that 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 so it's gone through 180 degrees and i thought that's beautiful I occasionally meet mathematicians who get very angry that anyone should consider this a proof. It's not a proof. It's a beautiful <laughs> argument, but it's not a proof. Okay, because... Uh, because we have standards for proof. It doesn't mean the standards for Right, okay. I, there, are, there are two different, there are two different uh, possible reasons people could... Uh, there may be more, but two main kinds of possible reasons why people could say it's not a proof. One is because we didn't know what a proof was until after Frege and Boole and all the kinds of stuff that you and others have been talking about here. And now we know what a proof is and it means you've got axioms and definitions and rules of inference and a precisely defined syntax where you get what you're going to express, which would fit in with what McCarthy and Hayes were saying. And I absolutely agree that defines a kind of notion of proof. And as far as I'm concerned, that was a great mathematical discovery of the human race, which gradually came via Aristotle and various other things, and sort of reached a peak round about Frege and Russell and, and Cantor and so on. But it was, for me, a new branch of mathematics. And it happened to have a number of interesting features, which is a lot of old branches of mathematics could be modeled within it, including arithmetic according to Frege and geometry according to David Hilbert and various other people. Now, before that time, for hundreds of years before Frege and Boole and so on, uh, it was believed that in Euclid's elements uh, which didn't use this kind of formal proof that we now regard as a requirement for something to be proved, there were things that were regarded as proofs. 
and they were kind of um, ill-defined, and yet they had they worked. And furthermore, I would say that Euclid's element, if I had to choose, and I'm not very widely read, so that may affect my choice. If I had to choose the single most important book ever published on this planet, I think it's Euclid's Elements. I mean, it's imagine the thing that whose some of whose results. I mean, they didn't all come from Euclid. But some of the results are still in use every day all around the planet. Is there any other book? Well, there are some books where they think they're in use, but they mostly do harm. <laughs> uh, all those is, you know, I mean, I don't know to, to argue about the validity or utility, but the Bible is a good run, is it? Well, I just said it, it, it does a lot more harm. Yeah, that's, yes. that's a separate debate, but you know, <laughs> yeah. impact. Yes. If you want to know but the sales figures. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> the, 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 the thing about Euclid is that you don't have to get the original because it's been so important that all the content has percolated through all sorts of disciplines and so on. And I, it's true to some extent of various Bibles and whatever, but not to the same extent. Anyway, let's not argue about that. So, so the, but question, my main the, question is, the question is, if we were, let's, if we discard the modern notion of a proof, and we say we got a notion of Euclidean proof, the style of proofs <coughs> that Euclid was using. Yes. The question you're asking, would that proof be, ex would, would meet the standards of proof then? Yes. That required more careful study of, of what, okay. was, what was acceptable then. I don't, I'm not an expert in yes. Euclidean on the elements to tell you, would this be acceptable or not? Right. But it's not obvious to me that it would be acceptable. Yeah, well, this, and, and that is, uh, an answer I'm happy to accept for now, um, but there are interesting things, well I wasn't going to say this but I will now because um, some of you will know that in Euclidean geometry it's not possible to trisect an arbitrary angle. That was not easy to prove and I haven't myself ever worked through a proof but one of the proofs for instance makes use of the fact that uh, uh, a number that's a product of powers of 3 and 5 or something can't be divisible by 2 or whatever but you know you had to go via Descartes from the geometry into the mathematical model in this other branch of mathematics and then prove something there and then back project and show it can't be done but that's because it's Euclidean geometry allows only two forms of construction in that mode of proof that is called Euclidean geometry. Namely, you can use a pair of compasses, you can adjust your compasses to, to, to um, the width of any sort of part of what you've already got, and then you can rotate it about any point where you've planted one, or you can put a straight edge through either one point and then rotate it, or through two points and then you can't rotate it, you can just slide it, but that doesn't make any difference really, and then you can draw a line. Uh, some people discover there's something else you can do, which is called the nuisance construction, which I didn't know about until a couple of years ago when I was um, uh, thinking about these issues. And of course, Wikipedia taught me, and then I saw there were other people who knew about it, and Carl knew about it, and various other. What but was anyway, it called? Sorry, the nuisis? N e u s i s. But the main thing is, um, I have a I have a web page called trisect.html, uh, which has quite a lot of detail. The main thing is it allows you, with your straight edge, to put two marks and then move it around and then do things. For instance, you can put this mark on a line and then rotate until that marks on something. Or you can slide it along something uh, until this marks on something and then rotate that until it enters it, that mark rotates them. Archimedes knew about it. I don't know if he created it. Um, uh, Carl, do you know? It was known by Archimedes' time. It's not known who created it. Right. Um, and furthermore, if you allow that extension to Euclidean geometry, there's a fairly simple, but I'm not going to show it to you because I'm already way off my planned talk. Um, there's a fairly simple construction which you, allows you, if you start from any angle, uh, you draw a circle, you, you draw a, a line corresponding to this, and then you use this useless thing, you slide a line out, and and then you end up with a new angle, and then you can prove using standard Euclidean geometry that that angle is a third of the angle you started with. And it'll work for any angle. You have to deal with two cases where the initial angle is obtuse or cushy. But anyway, but an interesting fact, which reminds me of modern people saying Euclidean geometry really isn't real mathematics. As I understand a little bit of 
ancient mathematical scholarship that I've encountered, that's what the Euclidean geometer said about the Newton's construction. That's, <laughs> that we can't allow that. And that's why for centuries people have been taught that in Euclidean geometry you can't trisect an angle because they didn't want to allow this as part of that wonderful <laughs> Euclidean construct. Now, one of my <coughs> counters to people who make this comment that um, what Euclid did wasn't real mathematics in some sense. We didn't know what mathematical proofs were until the last few hundred years, even less than that, depending what your, where your standards are. One of my comments is to say, well, do you think that the discovery of this extension to Euclid was or wasn't a piece of mathematics? It, clearly, going back to Kant, it's not what Hume would have called an empirical discovery that you have to test on high mountains and at high temperatures and on other planets and with different colored inks and so on. It's not like that. And likewise, you can't say we just had some definitions and we, of space and line and angle or whatever and we used some logic and proved this. You might be able to set up a mapping from this into a logical system of the sort that Hilbert did but didn't include this construction. You could ex perhaps extend to Hilbert to have some extra action and then model this mode of reasoning in Hilbert's axiomatization of Euclidean geometry, but it wasn't there. So I say, was that mathematics or wasn't it? Now, we could have a purely terminological discussion, define mathematics as only what conforms to these new standards of proof, and then it's not really mathematics, which was, I think, your initial reaction to my example of Mary Pardo's proof. And you're not alone, there are other people who think that. But it seems to me that if we don't want to call it mathematics, we want to re uh, define the boundaries. I don't care. There was something there which meets Kant's definition, uh, Kant's analysis. It's not empirical. It's not trivial. It really extends our knowledge, and it's an example of what he called synthetic a priori knowledge or synthetic <coughs> non-empirical. Anyway, there's three distinctions there, and, they, and in each of the distinctions, <coughs> the stuff in Euclidean geometry fits in the middle. And so does arithmetic, which existed. You know the proof. I you start with a, a, a piece of chocolate, maybe two by four, that had eight, eight uh, pieces, and you cut it, you configure it, and you end up with three by three, and you got an extra piece of chocolate. You've you anticipated know, one of my slides. Do you know this construction? Um, there is the, it's yes, a, there's a very long, you, thin piece of chocolate yes, missing the across the middle. It's never there. Right? Well, of <laughs> course, that, you don't make missing chocolate. But the problem is that, on well, the face of it, it looks almost like this, the same yes. kind of proof. Yes. And but we, need, we need some way to decide which one are acceptable, which one are not right. acceptable. And the point is that one involves a minor discrepancy. So it's, but so you can discover, and you can read. But let proof that it was a J. So, so, so the answer is, yeah, I would say on the face of it, this looks like a, a fairly convincing argument. But the same thing happens with the chocolate and requires some, you need to have some rules. So when I'm saying it's not mathematics, I'm not saying it's not mathematics, I'm saying maybe, yeah. you know, maybe we form, formalize it, it will become a, a real proof. Right now, I say it's a level of a, of a very nice argument that I could be convinced that it's a real proof if we sit down and sure. really formalize it properly. And what you're saying about this fallacious bit of chocolate reasoning is partly analogous to the disaster that Frege encountered when Russell uh, said, look, you've got all this wonderful stuff, but there's a problem. The set of all sets that do not contain themselves. Anyway, so mathematics is wonderful. It has all these different facets, I'm saying, and some of them are very recent and some are very old. And basically, what I think that one can't thought about mathematics fits them all and um, I was convinced of that, except I only knew a much smaller subset back in 1958 or 9 or whenever I was arguing with these graduate philosophers and trying to write this thesis. Anyway, I met Max Clues, 1969. He asked me to contribute a paper to this workshop for which he was the local, one of the local organizers, not a, a second international joint conference in AI. And um, I said, I can't, I've got a headache, I've got flu. He said, do it. So I did it. <laughs> and uh, it got accepted. And um, McCarthy and Hayes were there. And uh, I never really understood exactly what McCarthy thought about it. He never said, no, you got it wrong because. And we became quite friendly. We met and talked at a number of conferences. But for some reason, I never got around to 
probing, me, probing him on that. But anyway, what I claimed was there are other modes of representation which for many purposes have, I'm not going to say metaphysical advantages over logic, uh, but perhaps they do, that's another issue. I think they may have epistemological advantages, remember there were these three things, metaphysical, epistemological and heuristic, but definitely heuristic advantages, namely with the various kinds of problem that you can solve much more easily in certain, for certain class of problems using diagrams and if you translate it into logic uh, and, and do, do your proper theorem proving or whatever. Okay. And I gave a few rather trivial examples. And um, this paper um, was accepted and, and I think there were always some people who thought I'd got it all wrong but they didn't quite know why and various people said I'd got it right but they misunderstood it and they, the thing that they attributed to me wasn't what I'd actually said. In particular, I was contrasting a form of representation which I called Freigian where all the complexity arises out of application of functions to arguments. That for me was one of Frege's greatest moves which was to generalize the function argument thing from arithmetic which, as far as I know, was the only domain to which that concept had previously been applied to anything, any domain, where you can say a function is a thing that can take you from one or a group of entities to something else. And he was especially interested in the case of what it took you to was either true or false, but never mind that. So you can have um, but, but forms of representation. Some of algebra, I mean, group theory and... Yeah, those would all be Fregian. But they preceded, they preceded Frege, I think. No, Frege, um, they used functions, but did they have functions that were not, before Frege, functions which were not applicable to numerical objects? For instance, functions applicable to functions, giving you other functions. No, I mean, I, yeah. Anyway, I, I, but when I, I read Frege... The algebra preceded, preceded Frege. Mm. Who, sir? Abstract algebra. Okay. It wasn't exactly the abstract before Bourbaki. It was symmetries rather than... No, but... but uh, okay, I mean, so my... I'm, I'm, I'm maybe historically, historically wrong. I'd be surprised if Frege was the first. Uh, for me, it was reading Frege, I thought everything I've so far heard in my three years and four or whatever of mathematics has treated functions as taking numbers and producing numbers. And when I looked up, I, uh, I started looking up definitions of functions, and they were terrible in... Courant and Robbins and all kinds of that. And Frege had this kind of crystal clarity and he generalized it. He got the original stuff correctly stated. And anyway, my main I point mean, was. Peirce, for example, studied abstract relations. Sorry? Peirce studied abstract oh. relations, at least. Peirce was sort of co. Uh, a little before Frege. That, that was being going on in parallel. And yeah, yeah, a little okay. before Frege. I'm not, I don't want to say Frege was the only person. Yeah. For my trajectory through the universe, Frege was the first. Okay. <laughs> and, um, but the main point was whether he was first, well, it was a great addition, a great triumph to invent that notion, generalize the notion of function, including functions that take functions as arguments and can produce functions or anything else as well. And um, uh, what I was saying was that there are forms of representation that are not made of functions applied to arguments, but things combined into new structures by relationships, which might be pictorial relationships or temporal relationships. I can perform a, a piece of music <coughs> which gives you information about the structure of music, which if you're good enough would enable you to then produce the same, you know, another performance of the same piece of music. And there the temporal and other relationships are things you're using to get the information about what I did. Now, <coughs> so I said Freigian, and instead of saying non Freigian, I made the mistake of saying analogical. <laughs> um, and all sorts of people thought that meant that there's an isomorphism between the analogical representations and what they represent. And I explicitly gave examples of 2D pictures of 3D scenes where the picture couldn't, under any normal mathematically satisfactory notion of isomorphism, be said to be isomorphic with the scene. It's a projection where, for instance, a straight line of a certain length in one part of the picture could represent a horizontal line of a certain length at a certain distance in the 3D scene, and another exactly similar line could represent a much further line that's much longer, and in some cases a, a vertical line in a picture could represent a vertical line in the scene, the edge of a wall, or it could in, 
vertical line of the pizza room could be a horizontal line of the ceiling or a horizontal crack between floorboards and so on. So there are all kinds of ways in which analogical representations are in general not isomorphic in the strict sense with the things that they represent. Rather, there are relations mapped onto relations and arguments of relations mapped onto arguments of relations in a context-sensitive way. And I already knew enough about AI work on machine vision to know that finding out how to get from one of these uh, analogical representations to what it represents is a non-trivial computational task. There may be lots of local ambiguities and then you have to find global consistencies and so on. And some of you may already be familiar with that. But for now, that's, that's all by the way. So I was learning uh, those things. I, I read this paper and then I, Bernard Meltzer, who um, was then in Edinburgh and had founded one of the, there were four AI departments in Edinburgh, made of very bright youngsters and, and bosses who didn't talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> the youngsters did. And I, I got invited to spend a year there, thanks to Bernard Meltzer, who was founding editor of the AI Journal. And he was very nice to me and very kind. And I, he got this funding from the Research Council and I was going to do some research and write a program to demonstrate what I was doing. And of course, nothing of the sort happened. I just learned it. For me, it was like being four years old again. My brain was just absorbing stuff from all these clever people. And they came from all over the world because there were about only four AI centers, uh, MIT, Stanford. Uh, there were very few at that time. And uh, so the visitors came. I met Danny Bobro there, and he taught me Logo, and we had arguments about things and various others. Um, who was the logic programming guy from, um, Anyway, this is all, uh, Alan, doesn't matter. By now, you're all too young to remember these people, so <laughs> I won't bother. But I, I, I then Bundy, became, Alan so, Bundy. Do you mean Alan, Alan Bundy was a, uh, had just finished his PhD. He was a youngster. And he, he, he and I talked, in, but I'm talking about the guy who uh, invented logic programming. Um, he Kowalski? was at Texas. Robert Sorry. Kowalski? No, uh, Kowalski extended it, but uh, there- Alan Pomerau? No, it'll come back to me later. I mean, my brain's too old for these, for getting names out. The, there are too many cross connections and so on. And, uh, at some point in the middle of the sentence, I'll say the name. Um, <laughs> and some of you, but probably only two or three, will remember the name. Um, anyway, uh, uh, the guy who re invented resolution is perhaps actually Robinson. quite invented. Robinson. 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 Robinson invented resolution. Who? Robinson. Robinson. First order resolution is Robinson. Robinson. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought so it was quite. Yes. I thought it was quite. Anyway, the positional resolution probably Davis and Putnam, I would think. No. Anyway, it doesn't matter. This I shouldn't have yeah. got into that. <laughs> but the main point was he was one of the visitors, and he gave a guest lecture. So I met some all kinds of bright people, and I went back to Sussex, and we then started a new undergraduate degree, etc. And then I discovered, or around about that time, time maybe Brazil, I discovered Maggie Bowden had been doing all this stuff, writing reviews, and she was just publishing her PhD thesis as a a book, but anyway, I won't. I won't go into any of that. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I didn't do it in my year in Edinburgh, but I've got some more years left. I will try to work out work out how to build a baby robot that, as I had done some years earlier, and most of you, at first didn't know any mathematics, didn't know much of anything, but explored terrain and and developed, built a built a mind. In fact, built a brain because the brain isn't there at birth. Uh, all of it. Lots of bits get added. And I will show how the kinds of mathematical competences grow, but not by just getting lots of empirical uh, information and summarizing it, because that's not what happens when one becomes a mathematician, and neither by learning new definitions and, and then deriving consequence of it. Uh, so it wasn't fitting into Hume's two categories. And 45 or so years later, I still don't know how to build that baby robot. And I'm beginning to understand the difficulty of the problems. And something happened a few years ago. I mean, lots of other things happened in between. I did lots of work on, on learning more about programming, building toolkits, supervising students, and so on. Um, 2012 was the Turing Centenary, which some of you may have experienced. And um, out of the blue, I got a an invitation from Barry Cooper, who sadly died uh, in October, um, to contribute to a book he was editing, which was, or co-editing, which some of you may already, was anyone here a co-contributor? 
Okay, right. Yes, of course. Um, this was on Turing's life and work, and it had f four main sections, each of which started with or had uh, uh, some of Turing's major contributions, and then commentaries, short commentaries, uh, by all sorts of people. And I hadn't known Barry um, at all until about a year or two before that, when we had both been invited by somebody else, Gordana, something or other, whom you will know, yeah. who's <laughs> editing your <laughs> thing, yeah. and to to write a, a contributor book on philosophy and computer and information. Information, information. Mm -hmm. thank you. Right. And somehow it turned out that Barry and I had been asked to review each other's papers, and each of us liked and partly disagreed with what the other had written. So we sort of became acquainted, and I think it was because of that that Barry asked me if I would contribute. And um, there was a lot of interesting misunderstanding, and I thought I'd done all my stuff. I gave him three short papers for three parts of the book, and then he said, what about your contribution to part four? And I said, don't you remember we had, I was going to do that, but it was going to be too long, so you asked me to split into three to go into, and I did. He said, but you're still on the list for part four. <laughs> <laughs> so I wish to find out what part four was about. And that was about morphogenesis and emergence. And I think I had known about Turing. Has anyone here read Turing? Well, I'm sure some of you have read Turing's uh, 1952 paper, The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis. Okay, a few, but not everybody. And in that he showed that if you use some relatively simple mathematical um, specifications or patterns of diffusion, and you have a liquid in which two different chemicals diffuse at different rates and when they meet they interact in various ways. He showed, and I'm not going to even try to summarize it, that you can on the surface of this organism get a wide variety of patterns which depend on the details of the process. So for example you can get lots of dots, you can get lots of groups of dots, you can get stripes, you can get spirals, and it now turns out that this is really caught on and there are people all over the place, not in biology departments, they've known about it for a few decades and sort of some of them got interested but got clobbered by the maths I think. But some mathematicians now seem to be trying to investigate more and more cases and just a couple of weeks ago I, I found that in my university at Birmingham the maths department on one day had invited somebody from Oxford Maths Department to come and talk about m morphogenesis. And the physics department, in a completely independently, had in their theoretical science uh, seminar the very next day someone from Cambridge who was talking about a different type of morphogenesis. And there were very different kinds of physical processes that they were trying to model, inspired by Turing's ideas and going beyond them in various ways. So that's going on. But anyway, I read this stuff and I thought, how can I contribute to this? And then something hit me, which was, there seems to be a pattern in Turing's work. He shows that you solve the simple things that you can des describe very precisely, and you look at it the right way, you can then show, that, as if by a sort of kind of magic, but it's always mathematical magic, you can get a huge variety of other things out of this simple stuff. And I guess the most spectacular, widely known example of that is Turing machines. These very simple manipulations on a tape and then you can end up with something that's enormously general, um, including the universal Turing machine. And I think he'd started doing things like that with neural nets. Jack knows a lot more about Turing than I ever will. Uh, and he tried to do th other kinds of things by adding extras uh, to, to well-known mathematical structures, which I haven't gone into. Um, with um, adding an oracle to a Turing machine and, and stuff with ordinals, transfinite ordinals. And I'd seen all the, the pictures of him, or a picture especially of him by his mother, Turing's mother, drawn when he was a little boy, looking at daisies, holding his hockey stick while all the other boys are playing hockey. And, <laughs> and um, so I, there seemed to be something about two things. One is a real interest in life and biology and how it works. And also this amazing ability to show that if you start with the right bits and pieces and think about it in the right kind of way, you can discover generative power of amazing complexity and, and generality, which covers stuff you previously knew about, but in an entirely new way. So I thought, okay, he died two years after this paper was published. Suppose he'd lived another 40 years, and he had this behavior, this characteristic. What would he have done? 
I thought, well, maybe he'd have gone back even further to molecules and atoms. And um, if you um, think of the Earth as having started as a cloud of dust, condensing, and then eventually you get molecules of various sizes forming and whatever. If you think about it the right way, you should be able to come up with a kind of mathematical analysis of how we end up with elephants and humans and cats and, and um, uh, your slime molds and wars and murder and Bibles and, and, and mathematical theorem proofs and all kinds of things. Um, so I thought, how would you have done that? How would you have shown how you get there from these molecules? It's not obvious. I don't believe that, that it's magic. There must be some way. Um, I'm not as clever as Turing. Well, maybe we can try to find out something about the intermediate stages. Because lots of other people are already looking at fossil records and trying to find out things about how genomes develop, but also trying to find various kinds of intermediate stages in, in uh, complexity of behavior and complexity of morphology and so on. So maybe Turing would have shown the right way to think about all those changes and enabled us to show how, when you think about the right way, you then discover how Euclid comes out of it and how later on Einstein and, and so on and how Newton and all the other stuff comes out of it. This is me, 2011, trying to write an eight-page paper <laughs> for Barry, <laughs> which I wrote and gave and he included. But it started, and oh, and I had to choose a name for this, and uh, I thought, well, he's talking about morphogenesis in that paper, and evolution is a kind of morphogenesis, new forms come. But one of the things about evolution, which is characteristic of the kinds of things Turing seemed to like, was its products are capable of changing it. And that's why I called it metamorphogenesis. So products of evolution change processes of evolution. A simple example of that would be going from asexual to sexual, sorry, not simple, an example of that, well known, going from asexual to sexual re reproduction changes what evolution could do. Another example is um, when you've got organisms that have cognitive structures and can perceive others of their own species, if you have mate selection, uh, that can change evolution because people preferring mates of certain types can uh, affect what happens. So. Um, but it's still always just using the generative power that was there in the original system, but shaping the choice through the space of possibilities. So I called it metamorphogenesis with a hyphen, and then try to check whether this would clash with anything on Google. And some of you heard me report earlier this morning. I found it clashed with only one thing, a band. So I thought, I can live with that. <laughs> so, so I get called it metamorphogenesis with a hyphen. So that was... Uh, 2012 and I thought well I've only I don't know how much longer I've got to live but not not too long and this project is going to take a few hundred years I suspect but I'll start anyway and uh, see what happens and um, I started trying to spell out some of the details you need to look at try to take snapshots of kinds of things and later I might give you some examples um, and ask how could you get from there to there, where the jumps aren't as big as from molecules to Euclid, but other kinds of things. And the hunch is that if we do enough of that, we'll start noticing things that we hadn't thought about before, about kinds of mechanisms of information processing. Because one of my assumptions, what I think was also, would also have been uh, uh, Turing's and probably everyone in this room would share the same, that a key feature of life is not only what was noticed up to and beyond Darwin, namely changes in morphology, changes in behavioral competences, changes in environments, uh, but also changes in forms of information processing. Uh, so I thought we had to try to find these intermediate stages of information processing. Now that's a little more difficult than finding changes in appearance, <laughs> because information processing doesn't leave fossil records and so on. So it's, okay, it's a little more difficult, but not absolutely impossible. There'll have to be a lot of guesswork, a lot of teamwork, a lot of clever people, and maybe technical and scientific advances that we don't have. But we, you've got to start somewhere. So I've started trying to find what I can about various kinds of intermediate stages using previous knowledge. And um, uh, I started trying to expand on those ideas. And a guy called Stuart Ray, W-R-A-Y, who's a computer scientist, uh, had come out of Cambridge, is now a software engineer, works for a company somewhere, happened to read one of the things I'd written about this. I don't know if it was one of the book or one of the web pages, but the web pages are just growing all over the place in, on my website. 
So he, he started drawing a picture as he read, he, because he likes to record what he's learning with diagrams. And then he found the page wasn't big enough, so he stuck a bit on the end. And when he finished, he told me about it and sent me a JPEG and asked, can I have your permission to put it on, on my web page? So today I thought I would uh, make it available. And while I was checking out that um, it worked, uh, Jonathan came in and said, I can print that for you. So there are copies lying around there. And so <coughs> what he got was that there are various kinds of transitions and there are intermediate stages and some of the kinds of things that happen are evolutionary changes, others are learning that individuals do and these things keep feeding back onto what generated them and changing it and so on and uh, uh, this produces new kinds of machinery, initially there is machinery, there's got to be, the chemistry for instance, a Newtonian, purely Newtonian universe couldn't do this where you've just got particles flying around and bouncing them off each other with gravitational attraction. You need structures that can lock into different states, which is something that um, Schrodinger noticed and wrote about in a little book in 1944 called What is Life? Has anyone read it? What is? What is Life? Schrodinger. <coughs> um, and one of the interesting things about that book, which is relevant to all of this, is he, this is my loose paraphrase, so some of it may be stuff I brought to it and some of, some of it I got from it. Anyway, one of the interesting things that comes out of me reading that book is that most people think that the, one of the disconcerting facts about quantum mechanics is that things become unpredictable. It's all probabilities and statistics and so on. And he says, yes, but down at the level of chemistry where you have molecules, there are things that are capable of being in this state or that state, or that state, and it's quite difficult to switch them from one of the states to another because of the energy levels. And he talked about isomers, two molecules with the same atoms, but one atom's moved, the carbon atom, for instance, moved from one place to another in a mixture of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. And those different versions, different isomers, have different chemical properties. They will react differently with other things. And he pointed out, and this was before Watson and Crick, people had already begun to realize that there's a something, there are strings of things uh, people had found, um, uh, what do they call it? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and he, he, he thought that this kind of stuff had the sort of properties you need to guarantee a requirement, namely that information should be preserved over a long period of time in an individual organism despite all the thermal buffet buffeting of molecules moving around and even across generations. Otherwise, you couldn't get the kind of reproducibility you got. And he furthermore, from my amateurish, shallow reading of this little thing, uh, anticipated some what Shannon published a few years later, but maybe it was already in the air through other things, about uh, the requirements for discrete structures to be capable of reliably being reproduced uh, after various kinds of transformation. Anyway, that was all in this little book. <coughs> and then I discovered, I had it in my bookcase, I discovered I had some modern comments. I'd read it years ago, but I obviously hadn't taken it in. And when I was doing this stuff, it wasn't until I reread it recently that I suddenly realized there's a crucial bit there that's very important about how, as a result of quantum physics, the universe is capable of doing some of the stuff that Turing and, and <coughs> computer scientists, von Neumann and other people, reckon, and Shannon, recognized was important. Uh, and in a, in a world that didn't have these kinds of discrete states, it couldn't be done. Uh, enduring, uh, st relatively stable discrete states. Anyway, that's, that's um, uh, uh, Schrodinger contributing to all of this stuff. And I don't know whether Turing had read that or not, but who knows. There are all kinds of influences that ha happen, some by magic, I sometimes think. Anyway, that was Stuart Ray's picture. And now, oh God, where's time? Not God, but uh, we've got <laughs> 22 you? more minutes. We have 22 more. Okay, right. So, for part one. My, my yes, my uh, problem is to know which of many trajectories through this project to follow. So I'll randomly s jump somewhere and see what happens. 
Uh, let's go back to. Um, actually, I'll, I'll go to a different one. Where's my picture? Sorry, that's not the one I want. I'm going to quit that. I won't come back to it. So we are faced with the evolutionary problem of thinking about transitions between organisms of different sizes, different kinds of complexity of physical um, mechanisms in making up their physiology and so on, and different kinds of behaviors. Some of you may know of Betty, the hook-making crow. Has anyone never met Betty? I've got a video. Well, just, I think it probably take too long to show the video. Betty the what? The hook-making crow. 2002, she became famous. I will... Um, that since then, much more famous calls. Much more intelligent than Betty. <laughs> No uh, uh, this isn't a beauty or intelligence competition. Uh, but anyway, the main the, thing the, is... The, the guided student call by now. <laughs> Sorry, that... There the, are the calls that could be admitted to graduate school by now. Oh, well... <laughs> some who have. Yeah, some of them are disguised <laughs> as human. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so there are very simple things, which... Um, by the way, has anyone read uh, Tibor Ganti, What is Life? G-A-N-T-I. Mm. He wrote the book, he, he's in, I think Hungarian or something, uh, around 1973, and then it got translated about 1993, What is Life? And um, it's unfortunately very expensive. I managed to mm -hmm. get a reduced price Amazon mm -hmm. thing. But uh, he tried to analyze, as far as I can tell, better than anybody else, the requirements for a minimal uh, system that can feed itself, excrete waste materials, uh, control things like uh, how much fluid comes into it so it doesn't explode when it uses the osmotic mechanisms uh, for getting stuff in and out and so on and can also reproduce and he defined his set of requirements as a chemoton C-H-E-M-O-T-O-N and that theory has been taken up by various people but anyway that's an example of one uh, quite well known and as far as I can tell, very good attempt, better than other things I had encountered. Now, there may be better things that other people have done, to say something about the earliest things that have a collection of features which, for instance, a virus wouldn't have. Um, so if you want to say a virus is alive, and I don't think any, arguing about the boundaries is of any value whatsoever, the main thing is to understand the various cases and the discontinuities in the space. Attaching old labels to newly understood structure is a waste of intelligence. Uh, having debates about where the labels really belong. But anyway, so there's stuff right at the bottom which, to which um, Schrodinger's comments are very directly relevant. They just couldn't work but for quantum mechanics. But you need more than that. You need catalytic processes, which is something that some of you may know from Stuart Kaufman's work. Um, you need to be able to have these stable structures which are different but some new chemical comes along and suddenly it can unlock something so that it will very quickly go through a whole bunch of changes and come out as a new stable structure and very like what we do with our computers but only it's done with chemistry and by the way some of you may or may not have noticed on reading Turing's 1950 paper on computing machinery intelligence there is a sentence and I have never known anybody comment on the sentence which says, I may have got the precise wording wrong, um, it's very likely that in brains, no, in brains, chemistry is at least as important as electricity. Have you, did you ever notice it when you read that? Yeah. Well, anyone who's read that paper five times has read that sentence five times. And I had read it at least five times without noticing. So there's an interesting phenomenon there. But I read it after I'd sort of, again, after I'd been having these thoughts, and I was trying to think, what would Turing have done? And then I'd been thinking about the, his morphogenesis stuff. So he was clearly thinking about chemistry and life and intelligence and so on. Whether he would have done what I'm showing you, I have no idea. If he started, he'd probably by now have got much further and done much better, but never mind. Um, so there's all the stuff down there, still unknown. But we know now a lot more than, for instance, if someone had tried to do this at the time of Kant. Uh, 
who, for whom physics was mostly Newton, if I remember correctly. Incidentally, I believe Newton realized that Newtonian mechanics wasn't enough. He has some obscure stuff which I found by searching for Newton chemistry, life or something. And I've got notes somewhere if anybody has trouble finding it. That you need something that doesn't fit into what we now think of as Newtonian physics. And it had, he was interested in alchemy, you probably all knew that. And I think he was not interested in it just because he was interested in magic or whatever. I suspect he might have been trying to find these extra mechanisms that were not there in his theory of physics. But anyway, that's a detail. So what you might not know is that most of Newton's papers on this are just a few hundred yards down the uh, mm -hmm. block in the National Library of Israel. Cambridge didn't want them, so they fell off. <laughs> <laughs> That's the I'm, I'm loosely <laughs> paraphrasing. Yeah. Okay. Have, have they all been digitized? It's mainly the religious, it's the religious stuff. Oh, religious. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, of course. He might have had a lot of junk along with all the gems, mm -hmm. but when it's Newton, you, it's, you, you should do some junk mining. Anyway, so there's lots of complexity, even at the simplest, simplest, in the simplest forms of life, in order to have the minimum conditions of the sort that Ganti was, was writing about in, in this book. And other people have written about various fragments of it. And um, the theists try to say, well, you've got problems about entropy and the second law of thermodynamics says you can't that, but probably no, no one in this room would, would take that seriously because you've got all this energy coming in, solar energy, volcanoes and asteroids. And all the entropy going out, more um, to the point as well. Out of? And all the entropy going out as well. Okay, yes. Yeah. So, so energy in, entropy out. out yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, but even so, um, uh, these things all need to be spelled mm -hmm. out. But the, there are kinds of changes in morphology kinds of changes in behavior. So for instance, there might be something that can only grow and maybe um, absorb chemicals or, and maybe do some simple control of how it moves with the current or, or perhaps not. Maybe all it can do is control whether chemicals get in or out or whether, you know, whether it lets out waste products and doesn't let out the things it's going to need. Chemotaxis, you know, sensitive receptors. This is all information processing in the sense in which information is something that can turn something on or off or increase or decrease what's happening it's related to control from my point of view information and control are deeply connected and anyone who attempts like many distinguished people to give a definition of information and doesn't start from that link seems to me to end up with some kind of interesting structure but missing the way in which information plays its role in the universe, and in particular in life. It's part of control. So, but there's a lot more to be said about that, and that was partly what was in the paper that I contributed to the book that Barry and I both contributed to, uh, some early thoughts on that. But anyway, so some of the information processing is just on-off switches saying, yes, you can come in, no, you can't. Maybe controlling the flow so you can have variable rate switching and so on. If you've got a tail that you can waggle, um, then you can maybe, by waggling it, change your location. And you might want to decide whether you should or shouldn't go on waggling. So if you can record uh, the amount or, or the density of some kind of chemistry, chemical stuff just on the surface, and then record it again, and then work out whether the, the density is increasing or decreasing, then if it's good stuff, then you can go on twiddling in that direction. If it's bad stuff, try to go in another direction or at least stop moving in that direction. So there you get uh, the need not just to be able to record what's happening now, but how it relates to how it was before now. So there's an extension of information processing being used to control systems. Um, if you can start crawling around on dry land because you've got some mechanisms that can propel you, you might start finding that there are things in some places that you need at some times, some nutrients, at other times, for instance, you might need solid nutrients and switching it over here, and there might be water or something else over there. And on your first journey from here to there, you might find something rather nasty, but doesn't kill you. So you, it's useful to remember that there is this route, but it mustn't be a straight route. So now we have a problem. How can organisms get from merely being able to sense their immediate environment 
and take immediate reactive, produce immediate reactive behaviors to improve their lot or their chances or whatever. I won't say optimize because biology is not concerned with optimization, satisficing as Herbert Simon said. Uh, all you need is to survive and do better than others. Um, but here, in this mythical thing of all creatures crawling around on dry land and having to acquire information about where things are out there, not just in, me, in its immediate environment, using information acquired over a period of time. Now, I don't think anybody at this stage, certainly nobody I know or have talked to, can give me a plausible story of how biology, how evolution could have made that transition from merely local information being able to respond either instantly or with time lagged to the immediate environment uh, to the transition where the system builds up information about relatively stable, spatially organized structures in, the, in an external environment, which may not be perfectly stable, you know, some of these resources might disappear and others have to be, so that's another problem, how do you change your information? Um, but nevertheless, in here, there's got to be something with that, uh, that has that information. Now, I have what is a, just a wild hunch about a possible intermediate state, but I don't have any deep theories about how that state came from there, and how from my intermediate state we could get to that. But it is well known that there are many organisms that use the environment as part of their memory because as they move around they leave chemical trails, pheromone trails. And when you've got enough of them, the ones that are successful, they find the food, they come back and so on. Um, so they can build memories in the environment which they and their colleagues can use and others may die because they didn't find a way back or whatever. So perhaps there was an intermediate stage, and I'm offering this just as an example of how one might work on the metamorphogenesis project to try to fill gaps that you, for which you can't get evidence. And maybe you can generate hunches which makes you start looking for evidence you wouldn't have looked for. Where would you look? You look for current organisms that seem to be of this type that had this intermediate feature. But uh, I don't know if this would work with this example. But anyway, my hunch is maybe uh, some precursors of this, which were using pheromone trails, discovered that it was quite useful uh, to take some shortcuts between things where there weren't pheromone trails, but you could remember uh, if you go down the trail and then up, well, maybe you can take short, and then keep that information, not in pheromone trails in the environment, but somehow into some internal molecular, because they didn't have brains. <laughs> well, maybe this, these combinations of molecular structures with very primitive brains uh, would record some of the topology. I doubt that it would have anything like a metrical representation of that environment, you know, in kilometers or, or, or even um, no, paces or whatever. Mm -hmm. Number of steps. Mm -hmm. No numbers, mm -hmm. certainly, yeah. Anyway, so perhaps that was an intermediate stage. Of course, that still leaves open all kinds of questions about you add uh, all the stuff that Kant was talking about, the thing goes on indefinitely and um, it's got straight lines and planes and so on. But anyway, there, there might be some interesting, useful intermediate stages that we could look for, we may or may not find, but if we can't find it, maybe we can try demonstrating plausibility by building simple models using what's known about the chemistry, physi physiology of certain intermediate stages and so on. So that's an example of future research in the metamorphogenesis project. Very much later, we come to animals which build nests and do all kinds of things which involve interacting with an environment by not only taking in what is there in the environment, but also being able to perceive possibilities for change in that environment, given knowledge about the kinds of constituents that are there that are perceivable, and then to use these possibilities of for change and perhaps even chain them into sequences of change, change of realizations of possibility to get to places or to achieve states which they didn't have. And uh, the story about Betty is that um, she and Abel uh, were two crows brought from New Caledonia, that's an island somewhere near, near New Zealand, to Oxford because they were known to be intelligent and they were doing some experiments. Um, 
in a group led by Alex Kachelnik, who's still there in Oxford. Uh, although, I, although he's interested in this, I think his main interests are in other things. Um, but uh, he led and, and helped to inspire this work, and they did some tests. They said they wondered whether these intelligent crows, if given a glass tube with a bucket of food at the bottom and a, a, a hook made of wire left on the table, would, would discover, they'd be able to tell that there's food in there. They made sure it was food they really knew about, like, so they could see and maybe smell, and they could also discover they couldn't get it. So would they realize that this hook made by the uh, researchers could be used to solve the problem? And uh, in both the case of Abel and the case of Betty, it didn't take them at all long to recognize that this thing could be grasped, could be brought into a position where it was vertically above that with the hook at the bottom and the crow holding it. The thing could be moved down, it could then be moved laterally, and then moved up, and so on, and they got the food out. And um, then something happened that they didn't plan. Uh, the male had removed the piece of wire with the hook. Somehow, the experimenters didn't notice. I can't understand how they didn't notice, but anyway, they didn't. They brought in Betty, and she came along. By then, she was familiar with this apparatus, apparently, and um, couldn't get the bucket out because there was no hook. But there happened to be a straight piece of wire because they had spares for making extra hooks. And Becky saw, Betty saw that. And to their amazement, the experimenter's name, she picked up this piece of wire and um, without flailing around and trying all kinds of things quite directly, and there's a video of this, in fact, all, lots of different trials are on the Oxford Ecology Lab website. You go for photos and, and movies. Um, she managed to get the end of the wire into a crack in the plastic tray surrounding uh, this apparatus and moved the end she was holding so that it formed a kind of curve. Not a hook, a kind of curve. But that was enough to make it easier for her and this video showing her doing it to get the food out. So they were amazed. They thought, wow, is this some kind of weird fluke? So the paper that first published this says they tried 10 times removing the hook putting some more food there, putting a straight piece of wire, and nine times out of ten, she made a hook and got the food out. And it didn't say what happened to the nine times. She was bored. Well, uh, I met Betty some years afterwards, and uh, uh, not Betty, uh, Jackie, <laughs> who was the, uh, actually I also met Betty, because I went to, I, I thought I must set up a collaboration with Alex Kachani, who's the head of the group. And I went to meet him, and then I realized he's really more interested in the statistical learning properties of animals and mm. so on, and their optimizations and, and so on. But he didn't tell me, but I discovered a few weeks later that Jackie Chappell, who had been, who brought Betty and Abel over and who had co-supervised the student who did the experiments with the hook, she had moved to Birmingham. So I instantly made contact and said, we must talk. And the result of that was a uh, publication which uh, Susan encountered in each kind. She said, will you produce an extended version for a journal? She was editing International Journal of Unconventional Computing. Strange name, but anyway, they accepted our paper, and uh, that's another story. But Jackie and I talked, and it was very fruitful. She changed my way of thinking about some things, which I may or may not get to later, N not before lunch. But the main thing about this was um, what I started. I started learning more about these experiments, and one of the things I asked Jackie was what happened on the tenth time. You know, nine out of ten times we had a hook. She said, we think uh, she didn't make a hook, but she, she brought the straight piece of wire out, and it might have been the first time, but anyway, it was one of the ten. And she pushed the straight piece of wire down through the hoop and managed by pressing it against the opposite side of the tube to get the bucket out. Now, for me, it's totally incomprehensible that they didn't regard that as just as interesting as the hook making. But they were in a mindset which, for a particular kind of culture, is we're interested in whether animals can or can't make tools. Make tools. <laughs> so that was an example of what they were interested in. So they were blind to it. And, and Jackie, I mean, as soon as we were talking, all kinds of, both of us changed. Um, so I would say 10 times out of 10, you use the wire creatively to solve that problem in a way that was non-trivial including 
having to do quite sophisticated information processing to recognize, amongst all the things in the environment, that this one was one that, that would solve that problem, and then, without having to do lots of trial and error, to work out how to do it. And in the other eight, nine videos, or whatever, you'll find that when she does make hooks, she does so in at least five significantly different ways. I'll tell you two of them. Uh, and they may, maybe let her can remove. Anyway, one of them was the one I described. She sticks the thing into a crack on the edge of the tape, uh, edge of the tray, and moves uh, the end she's holding, so it forms a curve. The one that became most famous that led to the video, which from which there was a still, and I just copied, you know, made my own line drawing of the, of the still from the video. She picks up the straight piece of wire, and. I have no idea how much and how she knew what she was doing, but she clearly knew what she did. She stuck the end of it into the ducting tape that was holding this stuff in place. So she didn't try to stick it into the glass there. She didn't try to stick it into the table. She stuck it into the ducting tape. So she obviously got some information about it that suggested to her it might be able to allow something into it and then hold it in place because that's what it did. She stuck it in, and while holding the end, moved around, put it out. You see her in the video, looking at it, checking it, and then coming back, <laughs> sticking it down. And um, there's a flaw in my drawing, um, because geometrically, I don't think she would have been able to get it up to there and out. But in the actual video, which I only noticed after my, I had this drawing around for a while, before putting the uh, wire down to lift the cup, she puts one foot on the rim of glass so what she actually does is the foot's on the rim head goes in and then she's able to bring her head up to a much greater height without which she wouldn't be able to get the thing. <laughs> so there's all kinds of fragments of intelligence in there which um, you see in these other uh, other eight or nine videos one she flies up to a peg sticking out of a wall and there's a hole next to it she perches the peg sticks the wire in the hole bends it the other she flies up to a rail, perches on the rail, with the wire in her mouth, bends down, grabs the end, the other end of the wire with a foot, pulls it up with her, with her um, uh, beak, and then goes off because she's made a bend. And she wouldn't have been able to do that on a table. I mean, <coughs> she didn't fly down to a table and try because she wouldn't have been able to hold it down on the table. Uh, but on a rail, she could get her claws around. So there's stuff going on in that bird brain, which is way ahead of anything in AI and robotics and maybe even some humans but <laughs> for that particular class of things. I mean, if you've ever seen weaver birds making nests, nobody in this room would be able, even after watching lots of expert weaver birds, I'm quite sure that if you took, you know, several weeks of watching, maybe if you took several years, you might be able to make a weaver bird nest. They get 5,000 long thin, so I've got a video, but you can get one. Go to the uh, Google type uh, video weaver bird BBC and you get a nine minute demonstration of completed nests uh, and some expert males making who have made their nests and, um, and the females are trying to choose which ones to go to and a poor young sod who's still a beginner <laughs> who um, in this video with David Attenborough going on in the background this thing this uh, young weaver bird it's got its um, its long thin leaf and it manages to hold one end while it makes a loop and the video starts when it's already got a couple of loops held in place by a foot there's a loose end and it quite cleverly grabs it can't reach the end it's too far away but it grabs a part of the leaf and shuttles it along somehow with the collection movement until it's only at the end <coughs> and then it's getting ready to bring the end in to go through one of the loops but if it gets to hold the knot and so when it gets down there there's no loop for it to go through. so that's an early stage so we have to stop. To, we'll have to go to lunch right. and then reconvene again right. at 1.30. Anyway. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you so, very much. So